Welcome back, everyone, to our third and final day of this year's Menus of Change Leadership Summit Virtual Edition. We have already had an information and insights packed two days of our summit with scientists, business leaders, chefs, farmers, journalists, and other industry experts joining us from around the country and around the world. If you missed anything or just want to go back and revisit a presentation or recipe, you can find all of our resources posted on the website and the password is in your final details email, which was sent out earlier this week. We are so grateful to our program sponsors for supporting the summit this year and helping us to bring it to you tuition free, not to mention all of the exciting demos and conversations they've been holding in the Sustainability Innovation Hub. We've got a full lineup for you over there today as well. So please be sure to stop by during the networking times and say hello to them. And while we have been so inspired by the conversations happening in the chat throughout these three days, we'd love to formally get your feedback on how we've been doing. Please fill out our summit evaluation at this link, which will also be emailed to you after the conference. We are already discussing themes, topics, and speakers for next year's Menus Change, which, by the way, will be our 10th annual summit. So we especially need your feedback to make sure that our return back to the Marriott Pavilion at our Hyde Park campus will be a momentous one. Fill out the evaluation and then save the dates for next year's summit, June 14th through the 16th. And speaking of momentous occasions, the CIA is celebrating its semi-sesquicentennial, semi-sesquicentennial, I think that's right, this year, otherwise known as our 75th anniversary. In honor of this milestone, the CIA will be holding an anniversary celebration at our New York campus on October 7th. And we're inviting you to become legacy supporters to help keep the college strong for another 75 years and to support our anniversary celebration. Please visit the 75th anniversary website for details on this year long celebration and learn how you and your organization can be part of this incredible milestone. And speaking of future programs, a reminder that we'll be hosting our Worlds of Flavor International Festival and Conference in person at our CIA at Copia facility in Napa, November 3rd through the 5th. This year's theme is Cities of the Americas, taking a look at culinary disruption and innovation throughout the continent. We'll also be back at Copia for our Global Plant Forward Culinary Summit running April 26th through 28th of next year, where we translate the menus of change principles into delicious, globally inspired dishes featuring the talents of world-renowned chefs. All right, enough talk about those other programs. We still have a ton of great content for you right here, right now in this summit. Here's a preview of what's on the agenda today. And to kick things off, we want to hear from you over in the poll section. Our question today is, what is your preferred menu strategy for reducing animal-based protein? I'm going to go ahead and predict that a fair amount of you will opt for the strategy of using global recipes and flavors that are traditionally plant-forward, which is the perfect segue for our first session today, looking at plant-forward culinary insight coming out of Asia. To guide us through this journey, it's my pleasure to introduce Chandra Brahm, editor of Plate Magazine, Instapot guru and alum of the CIA. Welcome, Chandra. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's great to be here. And I'm really enjoying these conversations that we're having and the topic at large. Um, so many times uh, at conferences or just in discussions with people from the CIA, we've talked about the Mediterranean diet, um, which famously is vegetable forward. But um, today we're here to talk about the fact that like the Mediterranean diet, the traditional dietary patterns of Asia offer abundant inspiration for healthy, sustainable, and plant-forward menu innovation all over the world. Um, what's interesting though, is I find if you ask people about Asian food, their initial reaction is to talk about very meaty dishes. So they'll say, you know, pork belly ramen, or chicken tikka masala, or beef bulgogi, pork bao bun, general sow's chicken. And there's a certain amount of irony because of course, some of those dishes were created to strictly appeal to the Western palate. But um, for me, as someone who is um, part Asian, but also who grew up in the South, I see a certain amount of commonality with how we talk about Southern food. When Southern food got to be very trendy across the country several years ago, 
people talked about fried chicken and barbecue as if they were the only foods Southerners ate. Even though, of course, there are farms throughout the South producing peaches and tomatoes and okra and greens. And those are the things that Southern chefs and, and people living in the region say they cherish the most. Um, likewise, the geography of Asia is immense um, and very amenable to a plant for a diet. Um, on one hand, you've got the heritage of Indian vegetarian traditions. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the diet and mindful eating practices of the Japanese who now have the world's highest adult life expectancy. The good news here is that um, our culture's general interest in learning more about Asian cuisines mean that people are interested in going past, say, oh, I want Indian food or I want Chinese food to explore the differences between something, a uh, Punjabi uh, dish and something that is Tamil or Sri Lankan, or to try and go specifically for Szechuan or Hunan food and learn more about that region through the food. This is a tremendous opportunity for chefs to show the plant forward traditions throughout Asia. And we're here to do that today. In this session, we're focusing on insights in three regions, specifically Southeast Asia, China, and Korea. So we're gonna talk with chefs and change makers about those cuisines and what they're doing to counteract some of the more recent negative culinary and climate trends that we're facing. I'm very excited to be part of this discussion today, especially with the presenters we have on deck. And first, I'd like to welcome Mai Pham. Mai is the chef owner of the nationally acclaimed Lemongrass Restaurant and Star Ginger, Ginger in Sacramento. Born in Saigon and raised in Vietnam and Thailand, she's an acclaimed cookbook author and hosted Vietnam, My Country, My Kitchen on the Food Network. In addition to her restaurant, uh, and work her work with the CIA. Mai has partnered with campus, corporate, healthcare, and government dining entities to launch Star Ginger Outposts, Outposts which feature on-trend Southeast Asian flavors from hearty, authentic Thai curries and grilled meats to fresh, flavorful Vietnamese noodle soups and salads. So Mai, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to see what you're gonna share today. Thank you so much, Chandra. It's definitely exciting to be here and share a few ideas um, with the audience uh, about, uh, you know, strategies, uh, techniques that might be very relevant to the uh, Asian plant forward uh, kitchen. Uh, you know, the idea of plant forward is a fairly new concept in this country and one perhaps born out of present day health and environmental concerns, but it really is a tradition, a very ancient tradition throughout Asia and much of the world where vegetables and other plant-based foods are the primary foods, while meat and seafood play a smaller supporting role. And because these culinary traditions are centuries old and span many different cultures in Asia, there are obviously endless ideas and strategies and techniques that I think we can borrow and adapt to our modern day um, plant forward kitchen. If you take my family's meals, for example, you know, uh, as, as you see here in the slides, uh, growing up in Vietnam and Thailand, our tables were always filled with lots of vegetables and herbs and dipping sauces. We often ate fish because they were easily available and inexpensive with Vietnam's uh, lengthy coastlines and rivers. Pork and beef were served uh, less often and in small amounts, like maybe eight or 10 ounces to be shared by our family of six. So that works out to be roughly two ounces per person. But nevertheless, the table was always very sumptuous looking and tasting, right? And very satisfying. The first big idea from the Vietnamese kitchen that I like to show you uh, and share with you is herbs. If you know Vietnamese food, you know how much we love fresh herbs. Uh, they are served everywhere, out in the street, food vendors, in restaurants, and, and all that. Uh, at our own restaurants, uh, we go through cases of fresh herbs, and we use them for in many different ways. Uh, one obvious way is to use them for wrapping up foods uh, and for adding them to stir-fries uh, bases. So you get start a hot pan with garlic and chilies and a handful, maybe two handfuls of, of basil in there. And we also use them to um, uh, layer them in fresh uh, goi kun or, or table salads. The concept of uh, layering flavors, textures, and temperatures is also really key 
I think, in the plant fort kitchen. Uh, on the top right here, you can see the bun cell, which is the crispy uh, Vietnamese crepe, uh, the, the yellow crepe. People think that it has eggs, but it doesn't. It's just turmeric and rice flour. But we eat that by wrapping this really hot, crispy um, uh, bun cell with cool lettuce leaves and herbs and then dipping them into nip jam. Another uh, interesting idea, I think, is the concept of using meat and tofu together. It's very common in Asia. You're, you're stretching the meat, making it more interesting with added texture and cutting down the cost. And we like that, right? And of course, reducing the amount of animal protein. The traditional Thai table um, is very heavily dependent uh, on vegetables and less so on meat traditionally. That's how it all started. Mothers and grandmothers all ate mostly vegetables. A typical meal here is built around curry, soup, salads, and stir fries, and all made with mostly vegetables. And in the Thai kitchen, of course, lots of spices, right? Um, Thai curries, I think this is a key idea and simple one. Thai curries are very plant forward friendly. They are utterly delicious. Uh, they can be made in advance. We chefs love that, right? Uh, they can be assembled by putting fresh vegetables at the end, uh, just before service. And to me, every vegetable shines in a curry. Thai salads. Don't forget about the Thai salads. Who doesn't like them, right? They're amazing because of the way they're prepared and flavored. Uh, remember the green papaya salad, which I'm sure you might all know about. First of all, you pound the, 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 the papaya to bruise, and so making it a little bit, you know, more porous so that it can easily absorb all the seasoning and spices. Uh, just imagine the same papaya salad that you don't pound. So it's, it's certainly a very interesting and valuable um, uh, technique. Thai dipping sauces, such as also uh, true for Vietnamese sauces, um, from the clear nampik to the nampik pao, they're very intense and spicy and are often served with unseasoned vegetables or grilled foods. Another idea uh, for reducing animal protein at the table is to prepare it the Thai way with very intense seasoning so it goes a long ways. For example, seasoned beef is first made into a jerky, like, like the concept of the one sun, where traditionally grandma will um, dry the beef just for one day and ergo one sun. Uh, these days, you can obviously do it in an oven at a low temperature, right? Uh, then you fry the, the beef, the jerky, and then you pound it before you add it to a salad or say, you know, to a part of the meal. Imagine the, what, you know, the transformation that that beef went through. So to me, the secret of the Thai kitchen is an exquisite balance uh, of extremes. So there you have it. Some uh, ideas for you, which is available um, later um, in, in our recipes. Uh, but for now, uh, please join me on a quick video here uh, to visit my Asian um, herb farm, uh, farmer in Sacramento, the farm where we get all of our fresh herbs for more than, you know, 25 years. And then we'll take those herbs back into the kitchen and uh, show you, you know, what we can do, some of the herbs and how all the plant forward ideas come together um, very de deliciously for our guests. It's always inspiring for me to visit my herb farmer, Juan Pham, who, with her family, owned this beautiful farm just south of Sacramento. When I first met her and her family more than 25 years ago, they had a small lot. Now they own 25 acres and is a major supplier in the area. She grows almost every Asian herb you can think of, from rau rum, which we love to use at the restaurant, to Thai basil, holy basil, red perilla, and green perilla. I can tell you this is hard work. <laughs> well, now that you've visited the herb farm, let's see what we can do with all these fresh herbs that we brought back. Some great ideas for menu strategies for the Asian plant forward kitchen. Fresh herbs play an essential role in Southeast Asia, particularly in Vietnam, where you can see their use in restaurants, homes, and certainly at street food cafes. They're eaten like a salad or a side of vegetable 
or they're used to wrap foods like bun sale or Vietnamese crepes. Even takeout food is accompanied by bags of herbs. The first recipe is inspired by Yam Maku Yao, a delicious Thai roasted eggplant salad but made here with crispy salmon as a garnish. You char the skin of the eggplant over open flames to create a smoky flavor and then finish it on a grill or oven. I like to peel the eggplant under cold running water to easily remove the skin and keep it intact. To assemble, just toss with the classic Thai seasonings, nam pla or fish sauce, lime and chilies, then top with the crispy salmon, fried shallots, and of course, lots of herbs like Thai basil. The final dish is just amazing. Tofu is an important ingredient in the plant forward kitchen. It's so versatile that it can be used across many, many cuisines in raw form or pan seared like it is here to enhance texture, tofu is still underappreciated in the US and even though in Asia everybody eats tofu, both vegetarian and non-vegetarian diners. This dish is a great example of how tofu, which is neutral tasting, can be transformed into a most delicious savory dish. Now this recipe is very simple and it's very delicious. It's got a really nice texture. Um, I'm going to make uh, tofu larp, which uh, if you know Thai food, you know about chicken larp and pork larp and beef larp. But this is with tofu. You want to sear the tofu a little bit so it's nice and it has a, a little bit of a chewy skin. Um, I'm going to add all the ingredients and the dressing to it. Um, you got lime. This one here I'm making a vegetarian, right? So this is a, a soy sauce, a little bit of sugar just to balance the flavor, uh, tamarind, okay? And we're gonna put some red onions in, right? We're gonna put in uh, lemongrass, chopped lemongrass. Um, we're going to put in a little bit of fried shallots and you want to hold back some of the ingredients because you're going to put some in later. And the, the key ingredient here is kao kua, which is um, a toasted and ground rice grains. And to make it, you basically just uh, use some um, rice. Uh, you could use brown rice if you like and you, you, know, you roast it in a pan, dry. And the final dish is a larb that is so spicy, limey, herbaceous, and so delicious. Um, let's turn our attention now to another part of the Plant Forward Asia story and head to Korea with a virtual uh, visit to a Buddhist monastery nestled in the mountains of Southern South Korea and to the cooking of John Kwan, um, an esteemed monk, chef, and a very special practitioner of the best of Asian temple cuisine. Some of you may have seen her John Kwan profile in the Netflix season three series, um, Chef's Table. Um, I had a chance, um, a very, very amazing um, visit with her, a temple stay that I highly recommend should you uh, be interested in that. And uh, I spent a couple of days with her and uh, just basically, uh, you know, participated in the morning prayers and meditation and what a life transforming experience that was. But uh, we, she showed us, um, you know, her garden. She harvested perilla flowers. And one, one thing I wanted to share that's still very vivid in, in my mind today is uh, kind of talks, it sort of kind of speaks to the fact that what nature uh, can be in its natural self. But as she was walking towards, um, you know, picking some perilla leaves from this bush, as she walked towards and out came hundreds of beautiful butterflies and I have to say that I've never seen that. I've never seen hundreds of butterflies uh, flying around this bush in this space. And so um, it was, um, you know, it was very uh, life transforming for me. Anyway, her deep knowledge of building flavor entirely on plant on the plant kingdom is really, truly inspirational. And I think we have lots to learn from her whether she's working with mushrooms or tofu or how to make uh, soy sauce. And the good news for all of us is that she has promised to join us next spring 
at the CIA's Global Plant Forward Summit in Napa Valley. So uh, you don't want to miss that one. Uh, let's watch this short video that she prepared especially for us today. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet Menus of Change attendees online. I am Zhang Kwan, a chef and Buddhist monk at Chujung Yam Hermitage at Byungsung Temple in South Korea. I share Korean temple food with those interested in plant-based and or plant-forward diets and lifestyles. Today I'm going to share a few plant-based recipes using one of the star ingredients in a plant-based diet, tofu. Tofu is a valuable protein source and a key ingredient in temple foods. Follow me as I showcase a few easy, tasty, and healthy tofu recipes. Tofu is a plant-based protein that contains all nine essential amino acids your body needs. I'm going to make tofu jang, a dish made with traditional Korean soybean paste that's been fermented and seasoned, also known as Korean sam sauce. First, I'm going to transform this tofu back to its original shape before it became a block of tofu. Using a cotton wrap, squeeze the excess water out of the tofu. Add one teaspoon of salt for one block of tofu. I'm using natural sea salt. Next, add two teaspoons of ganjang, also known as Korean soy sauce, and knead it with your hands to evenly distribute the sauce. Mmm, that's it. Mmm, it tastes really good. Once the seasoning is done, put the mixture into a jar for fermentation. Press the tofu crumbles against the jar to firmly pack and finish. Today, I showcased a few of my favorite plant-based recipes using tofu. I hope to present some of my temple food recipes at the Global Plant Forward Culinary Summit next year. My best wishes to you and your family during this pandemic. I will see you soon. My thank you so much for sharing those videos with us and especially that farm tour. I really, it just made me very hungry here. It's lunchtime here. Um, we have another video uh, to enjoy next. Um, Zhang Yi uh, is an internationally acclaimed filmmaker and the founding president of the Beijing-based Good Food Fund, whose Mama's Kitchen project was named a top visionary of the 2050 Food System Systems Vision Prize by the Rockefeller Foundation last year. Um, under his leadership, the Good Food Fund has become a leading initiative in China to 
to promote a plant forward dietary shift. Um, his films have won international awards and been shown around the world, including at New York City's uh, M Museum of Modern Art. He produced a video about his work for us so that we can learn more here. We'll cue that up right now. February 2020, Wuhan, China, the first city in the world to be put under lockdown. Life gradually resumed. People are back on the street and out in the field, selling foods, buying foods, enjoying foods, harvesting foods. Yet the question remains, can we build back better? Can we build a livable future for all? And how? And in that future, what will our food systems be like? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Xiaolo. This is my partner, Ben. Say hello. Hello. OK, come in. And up there is our menu, which is based on plan forward concept. For the local pasture, we do have some meat, but it's not big. Yeah. So what's your standard for choosing your meat? Well, standard is, is the animal must be treated fairly, which is we always say animal welfare. Yeah. Here we go. Here's our herby wall, which is one of my favorite part. And uh, around here, totally about like 20 type of herbs, which is we can use. As you can see, there's a rose, there's a plum, there's kombucha, enzyme. A lot of them, pineapple, yeah. Here's the way to upstairs. Meet this Monday. Yep, it's such a big honor. Having 20 years of experiences in the culinary world, Guangzhou-based chef Li reached a turning point in January 2020 when he won a national champion at the second Good Food Festival in Beijing. Like the other 19 finalists, Li had to cook at a village kitchen for one and a half hours with all plant-based local ingredients. The two dishes he presented impressed the jury and won him the top award, a study tour to the U.S. scheduled for later in the year 2020. Yet, less than two weeks later, before we could even plan the tour, COVID-19 broke out and lasted to this day. And eventually they all will become my impression and ingredients for customer. Although he was never able to take this study tour promised to him, winning the Good Food Chef Award changed Chef Li's career path. After attending a series of workshops organized by us at the Good Food Fund, he embraced the plant forward concept and became one of the first professional chefs in China dedicated to actively promoting the concept. In May 2021, after months of delay due to the pandemic, Chef Li opened his new restaurant, the first one in the nation that's run entirely on the Good Food Pledge, starting with Plant Forward and including seven other principles such as animal welfare, healthy cooking, supporting local agriculture, reducing food waste, and so on. It's my childhood dream to own my, to have my own clock tower. <laughs> yeah, the reason I start my restaurant based on good food concept well, there are two reasons, I think. The first one, because the healthy problem become major problem all around the world. It's, it's mainly about the animal production percentage compared with the, 
the vegetable, we can change the percentage of our plate. What's a care more about what we eating every day, then we will make the world different. And I think as a professional chef, we 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 cannot like focus on on this area only. If as a professional chef, we we're gonna work together as a community, and uh, to pushing this concept, we will do a lot of contribution to the environment. If we were to name a few nations that are most proud of their culinary traditions, the Chinese nation undoubtedly should be on the list. China boasts a long, sophisticated history of culinary traditions. I use plural here because there are so many regional variants within China, and because they are multi-layer traditions, including food itself, of course, but also how foods are served, understood, and how they forged identity, connected people, communities, and the nation. The modern term for plant forward in the Chinese language was coined by us at the Good Food Fund. But the concept itself is no stranger to our people, or at least our ancestors. The majority of the Chinese are ethnic Han, like myself, accounting for more than 90% of the population. In history, Han has been predominantly an agricultural nation, which means that our ancestors were tied to their land. They knew that. They and their future generations had to rely on their land for survival and prosperity, so they must manage it with good stewardship and efficiency, which includes mainly feeding humans directly rather than feeding animals and then feeding humans with animal products. This plant-centric approach in our culinary traditions and traditional dietary patterns left us, the future generations. With an amazingly wide range of choices of plant-based ingredients and recipes for the kitchen, yet in the last three decades, with enormous economic growth, our dietary patterns shifted, and in many parts of the country, we have been consuming way too much more meat than suggested by our 2016 national dietary guidelines. Health and environmental consequences are grave. And so is animal welfare. Chefs and the culinary community at large have a key role to play to change all this. Chefs traditionally don't enjoy a very high social status in the Chinese society, but this is changing. When chefs become the messengers and change makers for better health and better future, their voices and weight will inevitably grow. Chef Li. And other emerging plant-forward chefs are an incredible example of that. In 2019, we took seven talented Chinese chefs to the U.S., where they attended the first Food Forward Forum. We have also hosted Rafi Teheran of Yale Hospitality and Greg Dresser of CIA at our Good Food Summit in China. In 2020. Our Plant Forward initiative, the Mama's Kitchen, was one of the ten global top visionaries named by the Rockefeller Foundation for its 2050 Food Systems Vision Prize. Chefs also have other strong allies as well, like Mr. Fred Chow, fourth-generation chairman of a Singaporean conglomerate, who's championing Plant Forward Kitchen concept. In China, I'm a partner of Good Food Movement, and we have our own cooking school, our own restaurant. We also have our own impact investment, and we are fully discussing this whole new way of eating and living. In exploring how we can be of help and facilitation of this whole movement, and we in China, as we look forward to see how we can all work towards. A better future. As the world's most populous nation and second largest economy, China has an important role to play for better food systems and a better future. And of course, 
None of the issues we are facing today can be tackled by just one nation. We do not have a choice here. We must work together globally to meet our shared challenge in food, health, and the environment. It's the responsibility and the calling of our generation, and it's a battle we cannot afford to lose. Yi, thank you so much for that video. Um, I'm happy to welcome back Mai uh, to the stage, as well as Walter Willett, who will be a very familiar face to those of you who joined the conference uh, previously. Walter, of course, is the professor of epidemiology and nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, you know, these videos that we're seeing are very striking. And I want to talk a bit about uh, about meat, uh, initially, Mai, you spoke of how meat traditionally plays a supporting role in traditional Southeast Asian cuisine, but that there are so much, you know, there's vegetables, uh, rice, noodles on the table to ensure there's plenty of food. Yi's video showed that China is facing a little bit of a reversal of that dynamic and even kind of getting into a bit of what the sort of quote unquote typical American diet would be. What kind of education do you think is effective to turn consumers towards uh, more of a plant forward diet? And what have you seen in your restaurant? And, you know, Walter, what are you seeing in, in your work as well? Go ahead, Mai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi, Walter. Um, it's, uh, it, yeah, that, that especially that video from China really um, affected me and immediately um, I wanted to do something more than what we're doing and the key thing for for me as a chef is how do we um, advance some of those ideas without a, a, appearing to be too political with our customers. Um, the good news at our restaurant is that uh, the fastest growing portion of our business, of, of our menu, uh, is the vegetarian uh, category. So we're seeing a huge um, uptick in people, especially during the pandemic, uh, which I find uh, quite interesting. Um, over the years, and I know that we have talked to, you know, Walter, you know, more than 15 years ago when he was first at the restaurant about the role of, of brown rice. So, um, yes, it's absolutely true that, you know, as as we become more affluent as, uh, you know, third world countries or emerging countries become more affluent, there is a, a transition to a, you know, richer diet with, um, you know, animal proteins, uh, something that we traditionally uh, didn't do and didn't grow up doing. And so I think that um, we, we, the good news is uh, we are seeing people shifting uh, from eating uh, white rice at the restaurant. We, we have white rice and brown rice um, and some other rices, but just to kind of stay on the, the healthy aspect of it, we see, I would say it's about 50 to 50 now, whereas when we first started after Walter um, advised us to do that, it, the take was like 5 to 10% many, many years ago. So I think that's a positive sign. I think people are much more uh, aware. And I think your question, Chandra, about how do we, how do we help educate people? Uh, I think through events such as this, where you have some really credible information and experts. I was just blown away by, you know, the speakers yesterday, you know, uh, educating me on the plight of our oceans, right? So, um, but I think that chefs can, can, can play a role in our way. For me, I, I chose to kind of profile the herb farm because that's something we have done. And so it's an easy, uh, you know, transition for me to try to use that story, which has always been there, but we never really talk that much and never really tie in the fresh earths with the idea that why, you know, why it's so important for us to do more plant for um, uh, eating and menuing in the future. Walter, any thoughts from uh, from your work of, 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 and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but how we can uh, educate the consumer? Right, this is a topic for a few hours, certainly. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think as Mai said, uh, a, a very critical part of it is what this conference is all about, which is uh, producing healthy, sustainable, and delicious foods. Uh, what we have to have is an alternative that's aspirational, people want to do this. Uh, some because it's good for their health, some because 
it's good for their planet, some because it's delicious, and of course, all combinations of those. Uh, it, and then we use, we really need action on all fronts, in schools, in our healthcare system, which is mostly missing in action. There's quite a bit going on in schools, in work sites, uh, in uh, the policies that support uh, healthy eating. Uh, we've been subsidizing in many direct and indirect ways, unhealthy eating patterns, and we need to shift that to make it affordable for everybody to eat a healthy and sustainable diet. So there's no single magic bullet here, but we need to be moving on every front. It's absolutely critical, though, that uh, it's just that we, uh, we can't ask people to give up something. We want to have people move to something that is the smart thing to do. That's the, again, the aspirational outcome. And that's, uh, it's critically important that the food service uh, be part of that. Right. Literally the carrot and not the stick. In this instance. A few little uh, sticks here and there don't help, but you've got to have a good carrot out there. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. I know this was a quick discussion uh, here, but um, I will say like for every minute you're at CIA, you get like an hour's worth of info. So um, <laughs> this has been fantastic and obviously fodder for more discussion. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chandra, Mai, and Walter. Definitely lots of food for uh, thought here. And it looks like in the polls, people are favoring those global plant forage, globally inspired plant forage strategies. So hopefully this was a great session for you. We are now headed into networking, this time sponsored by Nestle Professional. Thanks so much for your sponsorship, Nestle, as well as your snack inspiration, the Sweet Earth Awesome Grounds Queso Flamato. As always, we've got some awesome prizes on the line for those who participate the most in our networking activities. And today's starter question for our one-on-one -on -one networking feature is, what is your one big idea for selling more sustainable dishes to consumers? You can also hear more from Chandra during her Meet the Author booth and find links to purchase her book, The Complete Indian Instant Pot Cookbook. We've got even more culinary demonstrations and presentations happening in the sessions tab. And throughout these various activities, we hope you'll hit that share audio and video button to join the screen and ask your questions and interact live with our presenters and other attendees. As I mentioned earlier, our generous sponsors continue to inspire us with their awesome activities over in the Innovation Hub, several of which you may not have experienced before. So we hope you'll drop in to see what's new. Enjoy this networking time sponsored by Nestle Professional and see you all back here for the next general session at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern.